Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to our Explore the Bible overview of Philemon verses 8 through 21 for November 28, 2021 with the title of Restoration. In David McCullough's Pulitzer Prize winning biography of John Adams, he writes about Thomas Jefferson and he says, Jefferson was devoted to the ideal of improving mankind, but had comparatively little interest in people in particular. That is not the attitude that the Christian person is to have. As Christians, we are indeed interested in mankind as a whole. We are also very interested in people in particular, each individual one. In today's lesson, we see how the gospel led Paul to care for two people in particular, very different from each other, one rich, one poor, one slave, one free. But Paul showed particular love and care for each one of them. That's a great model for us. Uh, God shows us that we can do that as well. Uh, again, here as we get into this text, we see Paul, uh, verse 1, Paul's writing from prisoner. From prison, He says, I, Paul, a prisoner. Uh, verse 9, he says, now also a prisoner. He says he writes to Philemon. Uh, so like most of the New Testament books, it's uh, written to, it's uh, titled for the person it's addressed to. In this case, a Christian man named Philemon. Uh, and we all we know about him, we, we find out in this text. We can find out a lot. In fact, one of the things you might want to do is have your class just scan down these verses and call out what all do we learn about Philemon in these verses. And we see several things. He, we can see he was a Christian, he calls him our beloved brother. He's not only a Christian, but a Christian worker. He calls him a fellow worker. Verse 2, he talks about the church in your house. So evidently they had a house church in Philemon's uh, time. They didn't have church buildings in those days. They would just be targets for persecution, so they met in homes. Uh, it was a big deal for him to do that, and he was probably well-to-do. Uh, he had a home that was big enough for them to meet in. He had at least one slave, uh, so he was probably well-to-do. So we learned several things about Philemon here. This book is about really just one episode of the slave Onesimus who had run away from his Christian owner Philemon, and, and Paul was sending uh, the slave back to him to be reconciled. And he asks Philemon to give Onesimus back to him to minister to him. That, that's the basic story. And there's several good, uh, several good uh, lessons for us to apply along the way, especially how Paul's commitment to Christ led him to show love and care and respect to both of these particular individuals. Now, one of the lessons uh, we, we can apply in the introduction, verses 1 through 3, it's kind of a little side note, but I think there's some good application here. We see the terms in these verses, brother, worker, and soldier. And uh, I think those are significant. He, he, he calls Philemon a brother, and then he calls him a worker, and he calls Archippus a fellow soldier. Uh, to cross-reference that, in Philippians 2.25, Paul calls Epaphroditus all three of these. He calls him brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. And I, I think each of these represents a different level of commitment in a Christian life. To be a brother is to be a Christian, to be a part of the family of God. Uh, that's your entry-level uh, Christianity, if you would. Hopefully we don't stay there, but, but uh, some basically do. But then others, hopefully all of us, but uh, not all do, become fellow workers in the church. We, we teach classes and sing in the choir and go on mission, serve in the nursery, mow the lawn. Uh, we all have gifts from the Lord to use in the church, and we should be fellow workers. Then even fewer Christians are what we might call soldiers. Uh, there's a difference in commitment level between a worker and a soldier. A worker expects a certain environment and conditions and things like that, but a soldier expects hardship. He's even committed to death. So we might ask ourselves, what, and you might ask your class, what is your commitment level to the Lord? Are you a brother? Are you a worker? Are you a soldier? So you can spend, use that as a side point. You could, you could even, if the Lord led you to, develop the whole lesson uh, using those three points. If you're interested in that, I have a printed message on it at www.seanethomas.com. Go to the search bar and type in brother, worker, soldier, and uh, you, can, you can read that message. It might help you if you want to develop that some more. But by verse 8, Paul has finished the introduction and he gets to the main business at hand, and this is the focus passage, and he begins it, therefore, and there's therefore again. Uh, therefore, remember, always points back to something we've been talking about, so you can't really just start the lesson with therefore, you've got to talk about what came before. Uh, he's, he's pointing back, he says, therefore, because of Philemon's commitment level, because of the things God has done in and through him, therefore, he says, what? Well, we find the main subject in verse 10 where he talks about my child Onesimus, whom I begotten in my imprisonment. Uh, what's this? Did uh, Paul have a child while in prison? Well, in a sense he did. 
He had a spiritual child. Uh, evidently, Onesimus was born again, to use Jesus' words, and, and somehow, we don't know the details, but somehow he was saved under the influence of Paul while Paul was in prison. And that th this right here is a good point in itself. Paul shared Christ and won people to the Lord wherever he was, even in prison. And Onesimus was one who was born again during Paul's time in prison. He became his spiritual child. Again, we see his particular care for each particular person, just a lowly runaway slave. But what should Paul even have to do with him? Yet he loved him and cared for him, led him to Christ, and he became his spiritual son. So I think one application here we ought to be confronted with is what spiritual children do you have? Have you let God use you to bring somebody to him? And if not, you should make it the prayer of your heart that, that you would. And you can talk about with your class. Are, are there people around you, if you think about it, are there people around you every day in your city, your town, your neighborhood, your job, that you might be tempted to overlook? Maybe they're like Onesimus was, a lowly person, a lowly, almost slave. But you need to care for these people and seek to lead them to Christ. So some good uh, evangelistic emphasis there. Then Paul continues to write about this slave Onesimus in verse 11. It says, formerly he was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. That's kind of a play on words. The name Onesimus means useful in Greek. Many slaves had the name Onesimus for, for that reason. But Onesimus had lost his usefulness to Philemon since he'd run away. So he was, in, in Greek it's a creston, not useful. But now since he was saved, he was you creston. The prefix you means good. He is, he is good use. He's good use. All, all that to say, Christ had changed this man. He not only saved his soul, he changed his life from useless to useful. And uh, it might be a point you could ask your group, who do you know whose life has really been changed by the gospel? There may be someone who can share you know, some stories. Oh, this, this person was really changed. I think of the testimony of a woman in Montana who, who came uh, up to a church one day and asked the preacher, what happened to my husband and how can I get it? Uh, th her husband had been changed by the gospel. He was a new creation, and we should be too. And, uh, and like Onesimus, we should be useful to God's kingdom. And again, a point of application for us, how useful am I to the kingdom of God? Now, here's an application you could make, and it m might take a little bit of work, a little bit of uh, consultation with your church staff to do this. But I think a, a good application you could have this Sunday would be to have a list of places in the church where workers are needed. Uh, extended session, nursery, building and grounds, choir, lights, uh, tech crew, Sunday school teachers, committees with openings, all these kinds of things, ministries that need help. Have all these typed out on a sheet and hand them out in class. Say, listen, God wants us like, like an SMS. He wants us to be useful for the kingdom. Are you being useful? And if you're not plugged in to, to a place of useful service in the church, Pray about one of these. I think this would be a real, a real opportunity for your group to respond in a practical way to the Word of God. Get them plugged in to a place of service. Be one of the most practical, useful things that you could do uh, with your class. You know, it's one thing to sit through a lesson. It's another to really be able to respond in a practical way, and, that, and that's what we should want them to do. Show them some specific, practical ways that they can serve. Then verse 12 Paul says, I've sent him back to you. I think you might ask your class and y'all you, you could think about it and, and, and talk about it. You know, why do you think he sent Onesimus back to Philemon? Why didn't he just, you know, he, he had been saved. He was ministering to Paul. Why do you think he sent him back? Why, why didn't he just keep him? And uh, you, know, you can talk about different answers or perspectives on that. But I think, you know, under law, uh, under their law, Philemon was, uh, 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 Onesimus was, was stolen property. Uh, Paul didn't want to presume that Philemon would give him back to him. He's going to ask him to free him and let him minister to Paul. But he, he, he didn't want to just take him. He wanted to do things in the right, above-board manner. And as Christians, we need to be careful to do things in the right way. We need to do all we can to preserve relationships the best we can. How do you think, uh, you know, looking at it from Philemon's side, how do you think he would have felt if he'd heard that Onesimus, his runaway slave, had been found and he was serving Paul in Rome? He, he could have become re really angry. Uh, what, what's Paul doing with him? Now, now, today, of course, that sounds really bad, and it is uh, slavery. But you have to consider, at that time, slavery was common in the Roman Empire. So Paul didn't want to steal or, or presume uh, what would have hurt that relationship and, and probably, uh, possibly the church. So he worked through the structure of proper authority and asked him, 
to send him back. And he sent Onesimus back to work within the structure of authority and especially to preserve the relationship. So again, he was caring about this particular individual, uh, Philemon. So we, we see that particular care for people. Again, he cared for the slave, he cared for the owner. He, he cared for each one. And I think this is important because God wants us to, to preserve relationships whenever possible. I mean, sometimes you can't always. Sometimes you have to do things. Somebody gets angry and breaks the relationship. And there's nothing you can do about it. And, and that's sometimes we have to be uh, uh, settled with that. Romans uh, 12, 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. If you've done everything you possibly can to preserve your relationship with someone, that's all you can do. Don't obsess about it if the other person doesn't accept it. You've done what you can, then you can be at peace with it. But Paul shows us here, be sure that you have indeed done all that you can. Paul went to a lot of effort and sacrifice, losing Anesimus for a time, sending him all the way back to Colossae, uh, hundreds of miles, to ask Philemon to give him back to him. And he, and he went to all that sacrifice and effort in order not to presume and to preserve the relationship. He, he cared for each one. So, you might ask your group members to think, and maybe this isn't necessarily something that they need to say out loud, but have them ponder and pray, is there someone for whom I need to work a little harder in preserving my relationship with them? And God's Holy Spirit can bring somebody uh, to their mind. God values relationships. He wants us to value relationships. And as Romans 12 says, we should do everything possible as far as it depends on us to be at peace with them. Try to preserve the relationship. I love verse 15, just, just a neat verse. Perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you would have him back forever. Many of us have claimed that verse for, for loved ones who've left us for a time and, and we've had them back in, in God's purpose and time. The point is we as Christians should always have our focus on the eternal, not the temporary. Sometimes we lose something temporarily to gain them eternally. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw in Colossians 3 where the Bible says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So let, let's be willing to lose things here on earth in order to gain something in heaven. But then uh, I, I love this, this uh, last section, uh, verses uh, 17 to 20. And I would just call it the one to whom you cannot say no. Uh, you might ask your class, who is there here on earth who if they ask you to do something for them, it would be very difficult for you to say no just because of who they are and what they've done for you. And somebody might say, well, there's a, a, my child or my grandchild or a boss or, or some, an owner that I'm so devoted to. Somebody who gave you a chance when nobody else would or maybe saved their life. So it would be hard for them to say no to that person. This story might be helpful in this section if you feel led to use it. In the 1880s, a Viscount Ferdinand de Lesseps, who had almost miraculously built the Suez Canal in Egypt, set his sights on what would be another more miraculous project, a, a canal through the mountainous, jungle-choked Panama. De Lesseps' son, Charles, who had worked with him, had great reservations. He asked him, what do you wish to find at Panama? Money? You'll not bother uh, about it any more than you did at Suez. Glory? You've had enough glory. Why not leave that to someone else? All of us who have worked at your side are entitled to a rest. Certainly the Panama project is grandiose, but consider the risks to those who direct it will run. You succeeded at Suez by a miracle. Should not one be satisfied with accomplishing one miracle in a lifetime? His son really did not want to do it. But then waiting, not, not waiting for a reply, he added, but if you decide to proceed with this, if nothing will stop you, if you want me to assist you, then gladly I will take whatever comes. I shall not complain no matter what happens. All that I am, I owe to you. What you have given me, you have the right to take away. Boy, what, a, what an amazing story. And you can see the applications of that. That's basically, first of all, what Paul says to Philemon here. He, he asks this difficult thing of him to forgive and return this slave. And, and maybe there are people to whom Philemon might have said no, but not to Paul. He owed him too much. Paul basically pulls rank here, kind of asking this request and then saying in verses 18 and 19, if he's wronged you in any way, charge that to my account. And then he says, not to mention that you owe me your own life. You know, nothing like a good guilt trip. But, but here it's true. Uh, you know, and I don't know what Paul's referring to here. Maybe he led him to Christ and, and discipled him. Maybe it was something else. But Paul could state it strongly. He said, you basically owe me everything. You, you, you can't turn me down in this. And, and the relationship of Paul and Philemon here basically pictures the relationship each one of us has with the Lord Jesus. We owe him our life. 
He created us. We owe him our souls. He, he bought us with his blood. What do we have uh, in this life or this earth that he did not give us? We owe him our souls, our life, our eternity. What could we refuse of the Lord that he asks of us? He is the one to whom we can refuse nothing. And, and y'all could talk about it in, in class. What are some things that Jesus might ask of someone that, that they might be tempted to refuse? Uh, there's money, like the rich young ruler. Uh, I've known parents who would not give their children to go into mi missions or ministry or special service. Uh, some of us have refused to humble our pride and, and ask forgiveness. Uh, you, you and your class can think of many different examples. But if, but if we truly understand what the Lord has done for us, there is nothing he asks of us that we ought not to be willing to give to him. Like, like Delessup said to his father, we can say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, all that I am, I owe to you. I will gladly take whatever comes. Then, just another little side note, verse 24 at the end, it mentions among Paul's companions, Demas. Uh, Demas was a Christian worker with Paul here, but if you look at 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul writes, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Sad developing story that we catch here in the middle of Philemon. And then uh, just uh, by way of conclusion, and you don't have to use this at the end, you, you could begin with it, you could use it somewhere else in the lesson. You could have your group just scan through this uh, letter of Philemon real quickly and just list all the different individual names in this book. I counted 11, Paul, Timothy, Philemon, Aphia, Archippus in, in verses one and through two, uh, Onesimus in verse 10, uh, verses 23 and 24, Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Aristarchus Demas, and, and Luke, 11 different named individuals in this one book. It's as if it's emphasizing it, it again. God cares for the individual, not just for the whole world in general, but he cares for each particular individual. So did Paul, calling all these people by name, and so should we. And I, I'd say that's the most important thing in this text, the, the care for the particular individuals, and we need to care for the particular people around us. So lead your class to, to seek to care for those around them. I hope this overview has been helpful to you. Remember, if you type something in the comment section, I will pray for you this Saturday night and, and Sunday morning. And thank you for many of you who have said, uh, uh, Brother Sean, I'm praying for you. I appreciate that. That means a lot. I need it. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.